Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Pretty good, thanks. How are you? I'm hanging in there. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna give folks just a couple more minutes uh, to roll in before we get started, and then we'll we'll take it away. Sure, no problem. Did you did you hear me, Tezrin? Hello. Am yeah, hello, I, hello. Am I speaking? Am I am I saying anything? Is the audio coming the through? The audio just went blank for a bit just now. But it it's it's back. Yeah, I, can, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Okay. So what I was yes, asking sir. was, um, what did you learn in last week's lectures? Okay, you said last week's lecture. Yep. Oh, yes, 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 okay. Yeah, so with regards to the lectures now, I feel as though, like, I would have done a bit of thought before. Last week's lectures more also solidified my grasp of the concept of duty of care, more so, I would say because I will have had some like a bit of understanding of it prior and the elements involved. So that that's really all I can say about that. I'm sorry, you you broke up there in the middle. You it was it, it, you have a, a more solid grasp on what? The concept of duty of care and the elements involved. Okay. Alain, what did what did you learn in last week's lectures? Hi, sir. Um, honestly, I listened. I mean, I listened to what you said about like the breach of care and everything, but it didn't quite. Not that I won't say it's that I don't understand it. It's just that. It just hasn't sunk in as yet, but not because of something on your end, but more so because it's just taking a little while to sink, settle into my own head, um, to be honest. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, that's fine, uh, but we're not, we're, this is something that, you know, this is a, a an important piece of the puzzle and, um, you know, this is part of what we're doing in tutorials is making sure that you're okay. Um, so, um, so I, I want to encourage you, um, if you feel like you're not grasping something in the lectures, you should feel free, you should feel safe, like coming to me with questions and the tutorials are a really great uh, space for you to do that. Or you can come to office hours or you can, you know, make an appointment or, or correspond with me, whatever, whatever makes you more comfortable. Um, but we certainly wanna make sure that you're grasping the, the, the concepts as we work through them, right? So, um, okay. With that in mind, right? Alan's correct that you know last week's lectures were on the breach of uh, the breach of the duty, right? And um, we discussed a number of different uh, ways in which that. Uh, that breach can be analyzed and can be and and courts can determine whether the breach occurred. Um, 
And in particular, we discussed a couple of places where it can be more difficult. Um, and so that presents, you know, the, for example, the issues involving uh, the doctrine of res ipsa loquitur and issues relating to the failure to act as opposed to um, acting negligently, right? So those are conceptually two different things. Um, and that's, uh, you know, this is part of the puzzle. Okay. So, um, so that's last week's lectures. Now we're going to move on to talking about uh, this week's tutorial questions, which reaches back two weeks. Okay. So, um, so if you if you go on to e-learning, the tutorial question is um, to discuss the ways in which policy considerations shape the definition of the duty of care. Okay, so let's let's start by asking, what do we mean by policy considerations? What's, what does that term mean when we use it in this context? To be honest, sir, when I was looking at the question, that's one of the things that I was really um, scratching my head about. Because mm -hmm. what I was wondering is if it was referring to like a situation where the law would state or the law should state that liability should be imposed in a specific circumstance, but because of the broader picture or the broader implication that that decision would have, then that plays a role. That, that is absolutely one of the things that it means, right? Policy considerations just mean um, any issue that is not um, that does not affect the parties to that does not affect only the parties to the case. Okay, so reasons related to uh, effects that a particular decision would have on uh, larger, you know, on on other actors who aren't before the court. These are policy considerations. Um, so what are some ways that you've seen in your reading or in the lectures or in just stuff that you've read out in the world in which courts approach a case and say, well, you know, if we decide this case this way, there's gonna be all of these additional effects. What do we think? Okay, so I'm thinking circumstances in which, for example, someone gets injured on someone else's property, but it wasn't necessary to a fault of the property owner, but another party. And so the liability was not exactly the fault of the property owner, but another party, 
but then because of the need for compensation, it may be a situation where the court may then decide that it was a property owner's um, responsibility to ensure that, that their property would not have been able to cause any sort of harm to another individual, despite it was not them themselves that caused such liability. Right. That's absolutely right. And if you remember, right, we've seen those cases a couple of times already, right? We saw in reference to um, the uh, club owner who, um, who uh, allowed a guest to bring, who, who allowed a, a club member to bring a guest who was actually, you know, their muscle <laughs> and they, they beat the crap out of another member, right? Um, and the, the court held that, you know, you can't, it, it could not have been, uh, reasonable to expect the club to sort of look at this, uh, you know, wall of a guy and infer from the fact that he's big and muscly that he's there to beat somebody up, Right. Like, he could be, but he also could just be a big, muscly guy who's there to have a drink, right? Absolutely reasonable. The club is not the kind of place where uh, violence is likely to happen, and so the owners were not on the hook, right? Um, Think about as well some of the analysis that the court does in the Tumbes case that we read a couple of weeks ago, right? One of the things that the court says is, you know, if we impose uh, a duty in under these facts, okay, we are creating a situation where under certain circumstances, right? Doctors may have a duty to recommend an abortion. And, um, and you know, that was, that was the, the precedent that the Tumbes case was relying on was this 1982 case that says we're not going to impose a duty of care because it would impose a duty to recommend abortion. And we, we, don't, we don't think that that's something that uh, that doctors should be doing, right? Doctors should not be recommending abortion in order to uh, engage in risk management, right? That's, that's not an appropriate ends for that particular policy means. So do you see how, how this is sort of explicitly a conversation about policy in this particular circumstance? You don't have to say anything, but I am looking, I'm looking for that north-south nod, not the east-west nod. Hey, yes, sir. Okay, so we're we're good on this. Okay. Um then, you know, so so this is what we're looking for when we talk about policy considerations. And if we go back to um to the tutorial question, one of the things that you're asked to do, and this is, and I, I understand that if this is, if you have not prepared this, right, this is a thing that happens and uh, not, every, not every tutorial is going to be your highest priority. Uh, so it's okay, but this is, it says, be prepared to offer an example of a situation where the common law would not impose a duty, but your policy preference would suggest that it should. So there's no, so it's not a duty, but you think that it ought to be, okay? So if you have that ready, then let's hear it. Uh, if you don't, then let's take a few minutes 
you guys think about it and then we'll reconvene and uh, discuss what you were able to come up with. Okay. What are you, you guys ready to go on or do you want a minute? I'll give you, I'll give you more than a minute, but. I think that means we'll take the time, sir. Okay. I'm going to pause the recording. So let's reconvene. So um, coming back to the question, and I'll put it back in the chat if, so that it's right there in front of us. So be prepared to offer an example of a situation where the common law would not impose a duty, but your policy preference would suggest that it should. So what were you guys able to come up with? So I'm still trying to think on it because my difficulty is thinking of an area where the common law does not impose a duty. Mm -hmm. And that's really my struggle in this question. Yeah. So um, think about it like this, right? Um, what are cases, uh, whether it's in the textbook, whether it's in the worksheet, whether it's in your own reading of, of judgments, just sort of looking for cases, what are cases where the court has declined to impose a duty, um, that you think is wrong? So for example, right? So I'll give you an example, right? In the Tumbi's decision, um, the doctor relies very heavily on the McKay case where no uh, duty is imposed, okay? And the, uh, and the, the duty that was asked to be imposed was a duty to, um, to recommend termination where uh, normal healthy birth was impossible, okay? You could, if you, if you felt like McKay was wrongly decided, you could say, you know, you could attempt to make an argument for why you would say that that duty should be imposed. Okay, and that's really what what is being asked for here. Okay, so Okay, sir, so this is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the Caribbean, there are no quote unquote good Samaritan laws. Okay, not, certainly not that I'm aware of. Uh, there, there may be some, I'm, you know, there's 17 jurisdictions that <laughs> yeah. UE, UE graduates go back to. And so I, I honestly, there's no way that I could, I could maintain all of them sort of in my head. So, but, Yes, my, my general practice is to say that uh, 
there's not a there's not a good Samaritan law in the Caribbean. So from a policy perspective, I understand the reason why. But if I was to look at it from a policy perspective, I would say that some sort of duty should be imposed in circumstances where it is reasonable that an individual will die from whatever harm that have come to them. So, so you're, you're suggesting that there should be a duty to act in- Yes, sir. The, so, so that's a little different from the Good Samaritan laws, right? Because what the Good Samaritan laws say are, are intended to, to do is they're intended to remove liability from gratuitous uh, acts of rescue, okay? So the, the issue sort of prior to the Good Samaritan law is there's no duty to act, but if you choose to act anyway, there is a duty to avoid uh, you know, reasonably foreseeable harm. So this is this is why when we were talking about um, in the the you know omission analysis when we were talking about this, we said that you know there's no duty to rescue anybody, but if you do choose to rescue them, you got to make sure you bring the right tools and the right skills, right? So so the Good Samaritan laws say you don't have to bring the right tools and the right skills. You can make your best effort. And if it's not good enough, you are protected from liability, right? So, so it's a little different from what you're suggesting. And I'm not saying that your, your suggestion is wrong. I'm just saying that it's different, right? So what you're suggesting is imposing an affirmative duty to rescue uh, on passersby in certain circumstances. Is that, am I understanding uh, what you're saying correctly? Yes, sir. Okay. So what's your argument for why that affirmative duty should be imposed? Simple, to preserve life. If an individual is in a circumstance, granted, I understand um, there would be no imposition of duty to act if it if um it requires you to essentially put yourself in harm, but in circumstances where you would not have to put yourself in harm and you would be able to save someone else's life, right? Granted, if you were to act in such an absurd manner that it would have caused the death of that person. I can see myself looking at that from a different perspective. But if it is as simple as the example that was used in class where someone was in a car that was on fire and it was merely for you to pull them out of the car, then yes, an imposition to act simply to preserve life. So there's actually a case where I think um, if this duty existed, right, the outcome of the case is different, right? So um, one of the cases that the textbook talks about Oh, let me look it up and give you the actual case name. Um, here it is. It's the Van Valkenburg versus Northern Navigation Company case, um, which is actually Canadian, but it's referred to in um, in the Campbell case from Jamaica. Um, so uh, this is a case, uh, oh, if you, you asked and I had closed the book, it's uh, Van Valkenburg versus Northern Navigation Company. It's a 1913 case from the appellate division of the Supreme Court of Ontario. Uh, 
1913 DLR 649 is the, the citation in the footnote. So this is the case where the, um, the sailor falls overboard and due to some equipment failures and some communication mishaps, um, the ship doesn't turn around to go looking for him uh, until after he has sort of disappeared. Um, and uh, they don't find him. He obviously drowns. And um, the court, the, uh, the Canadian court finds that uh, there was no breach of the duty. There was no failure to act because um, well, let me make sure I give it right. Um, because, oh, here it is. Um, the sailor fell overboard solely because of his own negligence. His voluntary act in thus putting himself in a position of danger from the fatal consequence of which, unfortunately, there was no escape except through the defendant's intervention, could not create a legal obligation on the defendant's part to stop the ship or adopt any other means to save the deceased, right? So it sounds to me, Kesrin, and you may disagree, but it sounds to me like the duty that you would like to create, the duty to act that you would like to create, would reverse this case. Do you agree or do you, do you disagree? I think that would depend on how they would have to act. For example, if they had a, um, a buoy on board, they could have thrown over to him before they were able to turn around so sure. that he wouldn't have drowned. Sure. There's a couple of things, there's a couple of, of things in the facts that are not, um, that were not, uh, um, uh, that I, I didn't mention that I think sort of color that and sort of, um, suggest that the case fits into your category, right? There was evidence further upon which the jury might have found that if another sailor had promptly thrown the life buoy to the deceased on his falling into the water, and if the vessel had reversed immediately upon the other sailor touching the, uh, the man overboard uh, alarm, the deceased could in all reasonable probability have been saved. And well, I guess here's the Here's, here is the sort of statement, right? I didn't realize this was here until just now. If the defendants owed to the deceased the legal duty of using all reasonable means to rescue him, then they were guilty of negligence in not having done so. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's a statement about as clear as it gets that uh, if there's a duty, if there had been a duty to rescue, then this case absolutely would have gone the other way. <laughs> So, so, but I think that's, I think that's a really, um, I think you see now like the consequences of uh, where we draw the lines on the duty of care, right? So this is a case where uh, the claimant gets no recovery under the existing common law, but by incorporating our policy considerations and asking, hey, we should be uh, interested, we should impose this duty to rescue, we can actually reverse the case, right? And so you see how these policy issues shape how we think about these things, okay? So what questions do you guys have before we wrap things up? Yeah, so the other question said, um, discuss the ways in which policy considerations shape the definition of the duty of care. Mm -hmm. Was that like uh, something that was like specific, like, as in like the actual definition or like the legal definition of the duty of care? No. Or was it something more general? No, it was generic. Yeah. Oh, okay. You guys, you guys have done fantastic, right? This is exactly the, the kind of discussion that, that, we were intending that I was intending to have. So no, no worries on that score. 
Okay. What other questions are there? Oh yes, I had one question about work about the worksheets. Okay. Ah, uh, for the tutorials when we're preparing for the tutorials, the question that we're supposed to be looking at are the questions that you send in tutorial questions, correct? That is correct. And they because and they may and they may there may be times where I draw from the questions that are on the worksheet, but I don't promise that I will. Okay. Okay. So I, I just wanted to know if they prepared both. That's why I was asking nope, that. Nope. They will be they will be listed under the tutorial questions page on e-learning each week um and you uh but the the tutorial questions on the worksheet are not they're not bad things for you to be thinking about because uh they may make an appearance on you know as as part of an exam question okay so it would be beneficial to still do them okay okay no Ted. all right so what other questions? Last chance, not last chance, but just checking in. What what other questions? Anything else? Okay. In that case, we're gonna wrap up a couple minutes early. So I'm gonna uh, let you guys go and uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. So. Take care and bye.